Hey, welcome back everyone. We are finally back onto development of the uh, F1 gearbox. Over the past couple of months, uh, the gearbox has received uh, multiple upgrades and updates that I'll go over in this video. Um, you know, I've continued to develop the vehicle simulation model and actually uh, created some software that I'll show you guys. And of course, uh, I found a few issues with the uh, gearbox and some of the other parts along the way. Okay, the first upgrade that uh, I've done to the gearbox since we last talked was the gearbox no longer has uh, potentiometers, but uh, instead I've uh, installed magnetic encoders to read the uh, actual position of the shift barrels. Uh, this has been actually really awesome because I have to take the gearbox apart a lot. And before with the potentiometers, every time I took the gearbox apart, I'd have to recalibrate everything and actually go through each gear and relearn the position of every single gear. Now the process just entails putting the gearbox into neutral one time pressing the learn button and the gearbox stores the offset from zero uh, for neutral for both of the shift barrels. And I never have to do that again as long as the magnets, are, which are actually glued into the end of the shift barrel, uh, don't move relative to the shift barrel, which ideally they shouldn't. Uh, I chose to use the uh, AMS uh, AS5600 encoder, which I found on AliExpress for like two bucks. Uh, they do come with the wrong type of magnets. Uh, but I was able to order the correct ones from uh, DigiKey for really cheap, like under 50 cents each. Uh, AMS offers several uh, commonly used encoders like the 5048 and the 5047, um, which is the majority of what you'll see used with uh, different Arduino projects. Uh, but they do cost about 15 to $25 each, which was more than I was wanting to spend at the time. Uh, in hindsight, they uh, may have been worth that extra cost. I knew when I was buying the uh, AS5600 that uh, it only has a single uh, I2C address, which cannot be configured, uh, meaning only one I AS5600 can be used per I2C bus, or you need an I2C multiplexer. Luckily, the uh, ESP32 has two I2C buses, so this wasn't an issue. Uh, but it did impact something that uh, I'll, I'll talk about later on. So when I began to integrate the AS5600 into the F1 gearbox, I could only find a couple of libraries available for the AS5600. And it was clear that they weren't uh, as well tested as you would have hoped. Uh, I spent a couple of weeks actually learning about how Arduino sensor libraries and ITC bus works, um, trying to improve the uh, performance of these uh, libraries that were already available. Unfortunately, the uh, biggest hurdle is that the uh, AS5600 has an absolute position memory register that is two bytes in size. All the libraries uh, use the uh, most common Arduino wire library, uh, which can only read a single byte at a time. So to read this information from the registers, uh, you make a request initially for the high byte, and then a second request for the low byte, and you do a little uh, bitwise dance to combine the two. When I was performing reads from the AS5600 while shifting, I was receiving all sorts of crazy erroneous values from the uh, encoders. So I went through this whole calibration process the AMS has on their uh, data sheet, um, but it didn't help at all. Then I found a, a single forum post that, uh, about the AS5600 that had the answer I was looking for. So many, if not uh, most high-speed high I2C devices actually essentially freeze the low byte value when you read the high byte so that uh, it doesn't actually update that low byte value out from under you if the encoder or the sensor or whatever the state changes. So that is not the case with the AS5600, which was actually changing the low byte value during the read as the shift barrel is rotating. So this was also combined with some relatively slow I2C bus performance. So realistically, I was only able to read the encoder at around 10 Hertz. So to try to increase performance, I actually increased the uh, I2C bus speed up to 400 kilobits per second, uh, which did help some, 
and I was able to get up about 20 hertz. I tried different methods of reading the registers because some of the libraries I found online had different delay statements in between the byte reads. So finally, I found something called the U-Stepper project, uh, which is a closed loop stepper board for NEMA 17 motors that uh, actually uses the uh, AS5600 as their encoder. After looking at their code and uh, some of their forum posts, I realized that they actually uh, created their own I2C library to overcome the uh, limitations of the Arduino I2C library with the AS5600. Now, I took one look at that uh, U-Stepper library, realized the code was way over my head. In hindsight, I would have just gone ahead and bought a NEMA 17 with the U-Stepper board on it and used it for uh, both positioning you know, the, the shift barrels as well as actually you know, detecting any missteps. It would have been a lot easier. You could just tell it to go to a position and it figures out whether or not it actually reached that position. So to make things easier when uh, using the encoders, I went back to my you know, original approach for shifting using the actual Excel stepper library. Um, I actually moved the steppers a calculated number of steps based on the current position versus the target position. You know, after completing this move, I then check the position of the shift barrel. And if it's not within the threshold for the target position, I recalculate a new number of steps to reach the target. It's not a super elegant solution, but in reality, the steppers, especially with the planetary gearboxes on them, don't tend to miss steps that often. So now that I had the encoders reading the correct position, I had to deal with the absolute positioning values. And something I frankly hadn't dealt with is uh, modular arithmetic. Uh, this is essentially the math behind uh, dealing with numbers that roll over, such as a uh, 12-hour clock, or in this case, uh, 0 to 360 degrees. So when using an encoder to, say, calculate RPM for a rotating shaft, there's actually a really nice generalized algorithm that can handle this with lots of examples. But for the gearbox, this becomes more complicated because the shift barrels actually rotate in both directions to a particular angle position. So to calculate the number of steps that the shift barrel must move to get from its current position to its target position requires that you know which direction the shift barrel should be rotating, which is based on the direction of the shift, whether it's an upshift or a downshift, and which shift barrel is actually moving, the left or the right, and will the shift barrel have to pass zero or 360 degrees to get to its destination. So my initial approach was to actually calculate both ways of arriving at the destination and use the shortest. But determining which is shortest turns out to be a non-trivial task mathematically. It definitely was more involved than I was anticipating. So for now, I just created a table that essentially stores the permutations that were possible. And I just threw a bunch of if-then logic at it. You know, if there's any of you guys out there that are better at this or have some examples of how to position things with absolute position encoders, you know, please point me to them because I'm I'm definitely uh, uh, struggling with the mathematics behind this right now. Um, I'm still working on a couple of edge cases too, uh, such as when the stepper misses steps and does not make it past uh, the zero point when it was supposed to. You know, how does it know how much further it needs to go to make up the lost steps, etc. Now onto a challenge I've had since the beginning of the gearbox. I've always had difficulty tuning the PID to control the motor speed without oscillation. I also had difficulty getting the shifts to work uh, while the gearbox was actually spinning. And the steppers would act like they had insufficient power and the sliders would get hung up. And then finally, when I started to work on rev matching shifts and the vehicle simulation, these issues became strangely much worse. So initially, I could tell that my uh, little benchtop power supply was dropping out uh, and supplying insufficient voltage. So thought this was caused by a lack in power. So I went ahead and built a, another benchtop power supply out of an old PC, uh, but that didn't help either. So then I thought, well, maybe the steppers were being overloaded and that was causing some issues or drawing too much current. So I designed and installed um, these little four to one planetary gearboxes, which actually did help quite a bit and uh, gave the shifts a lot more power but the uh, supply voltage at the power supply was still uh, drooping. Then I thought, uh, well, maybe I had a bad power supply. So I went ahead and ordered an industrial 12 volt power supply, 
which actually worked the best, except it still had some terrible oscillations, particularly when I would let off uh, the accelerator pedal during uh, vehicle simulation testing. But then I noticed that the uh, power LED was dimming when I was letting off and the light bulb went off for me. So the uh, first DC controller that I, or DC motor control that I tried to use was this old um, RC style uh, speed controller. And then I switched to the Cytron MD13S, which I thought had an actual current shunt in it because I thought that was probably what was causing the issues with the uh, DC motor control for the, uh, from the RC car. But when looking at a different website from where I bought it, I saw the word regenerative in the description. So I knew exactly what was happening. Both motor controllers were actually feeding current back into the power supplies when the motors were decelerating, which is a bad, bad thing. Um, they do this to try to make uh, battery life longer, and they believe that these motor controllers are gonna be used with a battery. So in my case, I either needed to build my own current shunt, which I don't really have the electronics knowledge to go ahead and build one of those, or just power the motor with a battery. So that is what I went and did. Well, I know I said I wasn't going to, but uh, obviously I went ahead and built an accelerator pedal for the uh, gearbox. I think it's the coolest little thing. It's actually uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's just a pedal with a uh, 10K pot that's uh, turned by a gear as the pedal is depressed. Uh, initially, I uh, hooked this up directly to the ESP32 uh, in the F1 gearbox, but I found out some uh, undocumented features of the uh, ESP32. Uh, the ESP32 has two ADC controllers that service all of the analog capable GPIOs. ADC1 uh, cannot be used while ESP Now is active. And I found out ADC2 cannot be used while the second I2C bus is in use. It took me far too long to figure out this was the case, but uh, come on out a few lines of code and the ADC start working again. So. Uh, definitely be aware of this if you're ever uh, doing some ESP32 development. So for now, the uh, accelerator pedal has its own ESP32, which broadcasts the throttle position over ESP now, which is complete overkill, but it works really well. Now onto the vehicle simulation. I found that uh, debugging microcontrollers can be a real pain um, and being able to step through the code and see all the different calculations as they're happening uh, was going to be essential for debugging all this. So to save my sanity, I decided to write and tune the vehicle simulation in C sharp and then port back all the values that I come up with back to C++, uh, which really worked out awesome as I was able to create a uh, graphical interface that uh, helped me better understand how the vehicle simulation was performing. So essentially what I have here is just a UI that simulates um, full throttle acceleration um, through each of the gears so I can kind of get a feel for how long each gear is taking to accelerate and kind of what the acceleration curve looks like for each gear. And through this, I made huge changes in my models for aerodynamic load, for uh, engine load, all sorts of different things. So based on some recordings of F1, I kind of did some timings to see how long each gear was lasting and I tuned the coefficients until I got something relatively close. Now, I also tuned it part for, for part throttle as well so that I could get some uh, idea of what it was going to accelerate with part throttle. As you can see, you can kind of manipulate the acceleration through each of the gears based on part throttle acceleration. 
And I think it came out fairly realistic. Uh, I definitely, in the beginning, it was not realistic at all. Part throttle essentially uh, resulted in the uh, engine stalling immediately, which was not ideal. So it was a pretty straightforward path. Um, again, I literally took the code that I had written for Arduino, ported it over to C Sharp, and I started playing with all these different coefficients and also changing some of how uh, things like the error load were calculated. Uh, so that's where the F1 gearbox is right now. Um, it's so close to being done that I can actually feel it. I, I have to say this project has been uh, more challenging than I had initially anticipated, but I've learned so much, uh, you know, more than I thought I would actually, um, you know, about microcontrollers and microcontroller development and electronics in general. Uh, you know, personally, I need challenges like this uh, to learn and stay engaged. And uh, if you have a dream project like this, I, I encourage you just, just to go for it. Um, there's no right time that you'll have all the knowledge that you'll need. Um, I, I couldn't have predicted half the things that I needed to learn about uh, in order to get to this far on this project. So, um, you know, I think trial and error, there's a lot to be said for that. <laughs> and uh, as humans, we often put too much weight on what we don't know. Um, but, you know, even the biggest problems can be broken down into small bite-sized pieces. So if you enjoyed this video, uh, please hit the like button, and uh, if you want to see more content like this, uh, please consider subscribing. Thanks.